I'm notorious for saying that I actually think AI will make us more human. And Hello and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, I interview peak performing innovators in the creative, social impact, and earth conservation spaces. I also bring you ideas and techniques that you can grab and use to set goals, create, and unlock your potential for changing yourself and the world. And now let's get to the show. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Super honored that you're taking the time to be here and listen to this, and I'm honored you've got to hear about this week's guest. Oh, my stars. You know that this person is catnip to, to what I do and, and how I think. Let me tell you about Neil Sahota. He is a United Nations AI advisor, artificial intelligence advisor, IBM master inventor, co-author of the book, Own the AI Revolution, and co-host of the Changing the Story podcast. Over his 20 plus year career, Neil worked with enterprises on the business strategy to create next-gen product solutions and markets, and to create the culture and ecosystems needed that we all need to achieve success. Plus, I just found out that he's a former NASA guy, so, or maybe still a NASA guy, I'll have to ask. I am super excited to have you here, Neil. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me on, Zolda. I'm stoked to be here. This is awesome. I, I, you know, a lot of probably what's going to happen is I'm going to just be nodding and going, yes, yes, tell me more. Uh, because, because obviously you and I have so much in common, especially the NASA connection, and you worked on uh, in space science. You were doing space station work at Kennedy, which I think is amazing. And, and NASA's known for innovation that you know everybody's always looking at nasa as oh they're cutting edge they're innovators and they're also engineers and they're also people who are doing education there's a lot of stuff going on there but ultimately it's looking to the skies looking to see what else is out there what else might be out there and so the question i have for you right to begin with because i want to talk about some of your past but i want to i want to start just immediately what in your mind is innovation that's a great question. I really believe that innovation is connecting these new dots or hidden dots together in a way that we've never really seen before. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's strange because I know everyone talks about, well, there's that kind of that epiphany or that aha moment. I really think that doesn't exist. I think it's just that we connect that last dot with the rest of them. That's when it comes clear in our mind. And so in, in theory, we should always be you know, innovating, I don't mean that to be cliche, but that we should always be trying to identify those hidden or new dots and how they fit together into the larger picture. And and that makes so much sense. It, it, you know, they say there's nothing new under the sun, and yet innovators are constantly coming up with something that seems very unique. But like you say, it could just be the connecting of these seem seemingly disparate dots. In my mind, innovation is solving problems in a unique way, in a way that no one's ever done before, us usually using creative thinking. And I know that you you have started working some with creative thinking and the creative process, which I adore. And yet you're, you're still this person who you are very into something that a lot of us don't know much about, even though we talk about it a lot, and that is artificial intelligence. And I'm, I, I don't know a lot. I mean, I've seen the movies, I've read things, but honestly, I don't know that much. And so I'm going to ask you a couple more what questions. What is artificial intelligence? What does it mean? And how does it affect us today? And how will it affect us in the future? Oh, that, that's a series of loaded questions. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't ask easy questions. I know. <laughs> well, artificial intelligence really is uh, a computer that mimics human thinking. Mm. It's not really programmed, right? What we do is we give it something we call ground truth, which are rules on how to make decisions. So think about it like you want to teach a three-year-old child the difference between good behavior and bad behavior. So you can't like code every scenario. There's just way, way too many of them. Mm -hmm. So you, you give the machine these rules on what constitutes good behavior and bad behavior. So it can make its own decisions about it. And then you give it lots and lots of data. Right. And so it studies the data, it looks for the patterns, it understands things. It has a human teacher or set of teachers that 
ask you questions or ask you to do things and say, oh, that was good. AI, you're right. Or that was bad. Or you missed this part of it. And so it learns. And so it's actually able to learn on its own. So it goes from a three-year-old to PhD in just a few weeks. But then taking all its experiences, its knowledge, its ability to crunch millions upon millions of data points, the AI system can then actually do tasks or activities that require some level of cognitive thinking. And that's the real difference but we're, than we're used to with computers where we program everything AI, we don't do that. We're mm-hmm. not even like giving it, here's the algorithm. It's actually creating its own algorithm as it does the work. So where is that taking us? I'll, I will bet dollars to the donuts that everyone listening right now has using AI in some form, whether they realize it or not. I mean, you talk about recommendation engines, you talk about concierge services. If you have the Citibank app, they're actually using AI in there. And so we've gone from the past, which was a lot of focus on like automation and complex problem solving to now things where we're actually using AI to create new forms of art, to actually tackle problems like climate change, just because it remembers everything it reads, it does. I mean, imagine having like 20 million uh, medical studies lodged into your brain as you see every patient, you know, that's the power of unleashed with AI. I love that. And you're going to hear me or hear me not, but you're not going to hear me say things. They're going to be, how do I put this? I take these pauses because I want to take in what you're saying. And it's, I, some people call it dead air. I call it anticipatory air. So please forgive me if you just sort of, I'm, it feels like I'm not there. I'm here. I'm just listening and I'm, wondering and and synthesizing what you said so i'm i'm fascinated by what you're saying and like okay so there's a predictive algorithm that it's making itself the this this ai and previously you know we can look at computers to sort of do exactly what we told them to do that's what a computer does it tells there could be a bug in the programming or whatever but really when you tell a computer to do something generally speaking it does exactly what you told it to do that seems to be the difference if i'm correct in what you said uh between a regular computer program and something that is an ai situation if that's oh go ahead sorry you're spot on as well i just want to put one caveat in that and that the ai can only do what we've trained it to do. So those people that are worried about that Terminator scenario, <laughs> if the AI is bored, it's not saying they're like, well, I'm hoping to fight wildfires, but uh, since I have some spare time, I'm going to teach myself how to drive. That doesn't happen. Right. Okay. So, so it's not thinking on its own in that way. Uh, I love, I love that too, even though I love Terminator is one of my favorite movies, I have to say, um, you know, Judgment Day came and went and I was uh, I was like, oh, that happened and didn't happen. OK, good. Good to know. I'm not moving on. But but at the same time, when you're in when you're in that space and you're looking at AI, there is that human component. Like you said, it will only do what we've trained it to do or what you've trained it to do since I'm not involved in it at all. But if it's if it's going to only do what you've trained it to do and there's an unpredictability that cannot happen, therefore, how how much can an AI really mimic the innovations, for example, that a human might be able to come up with? So that is a great question. Great question, Isolde. And the answer is that it actually can't. Okay. So AI is not good at imagination. It's not good at creative thinking. Again, it can only do what we teach it. And what we found is things that we can commoditize, that's what we can wind up teaching AI. Mm -hmm. But other things like here's a first of a kind, or, you know, we were talking about NASA earlier, you know, a whole new type of alien species that might be silicon based, right? The, the AI doesn't have enough where to all to imagine those scenarios. Right. So right. there are things that machines do better than us, but there are a lot of things that human beings do better than AI. 
And, and, you know, and we can coexist, right? I mean, that's, that's the thing you're talking about. Like to me, when, when I heard you talking about it, I thought, oh, Star Trek, they were talking about these, these silicon based uh, life forms, for example, as opposed to carbon based. So when we're looking at this sort of thing and the AI would look at it and go, this doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand it. And what, what would an AI do then? Does it shut down? Does it try alternates? What happens? I'll give you the typical MBA answer. It <laughs> depends. <laughs> yeah, it, it really depends on what we've taught the AI to do in these circumstances. Most, most often what we'll say is when it comes across something unusual or something it doesn't understand, it'll flag it and send it so that people can actually review it. Right. It, it, if you don't do that, it'll probably just say uh, unknown or I don't understand and quit, quit on that part. Right. But right. that's, that's the more common thing is we'll actually flag that for human review. I give you an example. Mm -hmm. My work with the United Nations, they're really big about AI robot judges, right? Backlogs in the courts, less corruption, improve access to justice. And one of the things that actually has happened is in Estonia, they've actually developed these AI robot judges for traffic court. Hmm. Because speeding tickets, running a red light are very, I'll call it standardized <laughs> types of infractions. So these AI robot judges could handle like 90% of the cases, but there's still that 10% where something unusual happened. And those still get referred back to human judges. Right. So like someone was, you know, doing 140 kilometers per hour at an 80 kilometer per hour zone, but they're saying like, oh, you know, my... My, my, my friend was having huge pains. I was trying to get him to the emergency room. Right. 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 So or my wife is pregnant and she was having the baby and I was trying to get to the hospital when there's a when there's a reason for it that that could be construed as enough of a of a flag, it would flag it and then move on. You got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that make, that makes a lot of sense. And I love Estonia. Thank you for bringing it up. Tallinn is one of my favorite cities. Uh, I, I, I'm I'm curious though. We're we're in this place. We're talking about this this notion of artificial intelligence and what it can and can't do. And yet, when we talk about people, like you said, well, it'll flag it for for someone human to go. Okay, let me actually put that human element of it and and think sort of outside the box. Think innovatively or think creatively and see what what might be a better judgment when a computer sees an AI sees, oh, this person's wife was pregnant and having the baby and they had to go to the hospital. So then they need a human person. And yet, you know, we we understand that human humans are going to think differently. They're going to think outside the box. And you've you mentioned several times thinking creatively, which, again, is catnip to me. But a lot of us focus in on what we know rather than on what we don't know. We we struggle with that creative thinking. And I work with when, in my work with my clients, I work on that a lot about how to how to release ourselves from that particular struggle and, and embrace creative thinking. But I think people do struggle with it. And I'm wondering, do you have thoughts on that? What makes us struggle to create to create or to innovate? A lot of it has to do, I think, with familiarity that mm. we've seen something or experienced something enough that we think that's the normal pattern, I guess I'll call it. Mm -hmm. And tied to that is that we're used to like computers, machines being about automation, right? A way of doing something faster, cheaper, less errors, not realizing we've evolved the tool set that we've created new tools with new capabilities that we could tap into. We just, we don't know that. And because we've gone this pattern of familiarity, we're like, well, we have all these smart technologists, they can usually tell us what we could do with these new tools. We're at a point now where you look at something like AI, or even the metaverse, that with all these new capabilities, the technologists, as far as they are, they don't have the domain understanding of the pain points. And as a result, they can't really tell you what you could do with it, because they don't really know where to even try and focus it, let alone understand what the, the challenges are for your particular job or industry. You know, if I could share maybe a bit of a personal story. Please. Um, years ago, I had a cousin. Uh, I still have, she's still my cousin, but uh, <laughs> she has a history of uh, back problems. And mm -hmm. like one night her sister called me up and said that she's really having a, a bad time. She's complaining about the back pain that's moving around. So we took her to the emergency room and, you know, they did a quick, 
like x-ray, but based on our history, they're like, we think her disc is about to, to rupture. You know, they're preparing her for like emergency surgery. And to be honest, they were probably wheeling her into the operating room when, you know, there was a doctor burst through <laughs> into where we were. So we're was my cousin told her, told her and ran off and stopped them and said, hey, I just looked at the x-ray. She has a kidney stone. <sighs> right. Oh, boy. And they were just like, because of her past medical history, the back thing, they got locked into that. Right. And they weren't looking at the symptoms she was not exhibiting around, you know, like a, a disc injury. They're just looking at a few things. And it also turned out that one of the things she was complaining about was that she was super thirsty, which is actually a major sign or symptom of a kidney stone. Mm. So I know it's a bang, bang situation. I know our ER folks are doing the best they can because they got a lot of patients to triage, but that's a great example of how we fall into this familiarity trap and mm -hmm. actually doing a lot of work with AI and healthcare for well, the past 11 years. One of the first things we actually started developing was a, a tool for doctors, especially like in the ER situations where you have a little AI assistant in the background and it's like listening to everything and it's looking at, okay, these are the symptoms that are getting identified but these are the symptoms that are not getting identified. And it's kind of scoring the top five likelihood of what the diagnosis is. So it's looking at what's there and what's not there. And that's that latter part is where we suck at. <laughs> well, and, and there is this confirmation bias thing happening also that, that you are thinking, oh, this must be what it is. And then you start as a, as a person, you start discounting the other stuff, not because you're doing your job poorly, but because you start focusing in on the one thing it could be rather than keeping an open mind on all the things it could be because of that, you know, lack of time and all of that. And my, my sister is a doctor and she's an amazing diagnostician. And she has she has to look at different, you know, different. She's a dermatologist and she has to look at different slides in different ways to see what else it could be, in part because she's teaching. Right. That's that's part of her job is to teach uh, medical school residents. And so she has to look outside the box because she has to teach it. And I found that we often learn best when we teach others. So when you're doing this work, how much of what you're doing is is helping people to unlock that part of themselves through the teaching? It's it's a lot. Actually, it's a big chunk of it. Um, I'm notorious for saying that I actually think AI will make us more human. And you know, a lot of people scratch their heads on that one. But that's what we're actually uncovering because we're we're forced to really think through that, okay, what are all the facets? You know, what, what are the things we sh we really should be doing ideally for diagnosis mm -hmm. or driving a car or, you know, helping people with mental health issues. That's the challenge we have. We take so many things for granted and we think what we're, what we're doing is the best way because it worked. You think about driving a car, right? The first generation of self-driving cars relied on camera data because how do human beings drive? We do with our eyes, right? It right. worked right. pretty well. And, one day there was a guy in a Tesla. He was watching a Harry Potter movie. I'm not joking. So he had his autopilot on. Didn't see that a truck was wiped out on the highway. And even though you could see the truck bed was blocking the road about 300 meters out, the Tesla never stopped. And it ran right through, ripped the top of the car off. Wow. We're all like, what? How did this happen? Well, it was a cloudy day. And the truck bed was like a grayish white. And so from the camera's perspective, the truck bed just blended into the background. So I never really saw it. And we're just going like, we're you know hitting our foreheads and we're like, you know, if the car had been using radar, this never would have happened. And they're like, wait a second, why are we using radar? In fact, we could use LIDAR. And, and today we, those things are used. We're using auditory sensors because we know you can hear the little kid about to run across the street before you see the little kid run across the street. Right. We're using IoT sensors in the road, in the car, other cars. I mean, that autonomous vehicle now is processing about a thousand data points per second in real time. Wow. It's, it, it could drive using things that as humans we could never do, but why did we start just with cameras? That's our own bias. That's what we've done. It's worked pretty well for over a hundred years. Why fix something that's not broken? Well, machines, AI have different capabilities. 
we could tap into that. That's that's why I know a lot of people find it hard to believe, but self-driving cars are actually better drivers than human beings. Yeah, maybe nowadays, yeah. That that's that Tesla story scares me a little, but but at the <laughs> same, no, I, I'll be honest. I mean, there's something I I have maybe I have trust issues. Maybe that's the problem. I don't know if I'd be ready to trust a car to do it for me. And yet, I you know, in the Atlanta airport, there is that that monorail thing that takes you from from your plane to the main terminal. And I only recently found out there's no driver. It's just by itself. And I went, oh. Because I sat in the fresh in the first car and I went, wait a minute, there's nobody driving this thing. And I and I'd been just fine for years using that that particular uh, monorail to get around the airport. Every time I went to Atlanta, I used it. Never knew that there that it was driverless. So sometimes the trust happens whether or not we want it to. And yet this this is all stuff we it's it is disruptive. I mean, I know you're a proponent of disruptive thinking, which I think is great, but it, it definitely it disrupted my mindset because I had no idea there wasn't somebody there starting and stopping this thing so we there's a certain amount of trust that we have to take on to be able to to trust that the machine will do it and you said something that i'm very interested in you said you 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 put a lot of data into the ai i'm imagining it's some sort of programming or something that you put all that data in there that it has access to all of the different law cases in traffic court ever, or all of the different possible symptoms of kidney stones and back issues and all of that for the medical part. And and when we're when you're doing that, when you're actually programming it so that it will know all of that, it it can't I don't I don't even know how to ask the question. Can it learn on its own in that way then and go, okay, I'm gonna synthesize all of these different possibilities because it's also listening is that how it works yeah it's combining all it's all this data and it's experience these things to actually find those other hidden dots and connect them together uh, i'll share another story where yeah. there's a company called legal mation started by three lawyers not much technical knowledge and that's typically how ai works but they essentially developed like an associate lawyer ai lawyer and hmm one of their first clients was actually Walmart. And Walmart had a, a case where a guy, ironically a dentist, uh, bought a whole chicken, been to the gizzard, chipped his tooth. So he sued Walmart for damages. I don't know what Walmart would normally pay, at 20, 30,000 or something, just to be done with the headache. But now that they're using this legalmation AI, the AI got the complaint, it read it, you know, it starts generating the corresponding court documents and the deposition questions, but also it's formulates some initial case strategy. And one of the things that came back saying was, it's a material fact that when chickens eat, they eat stones and that gets stored in the gizzard. So by the plaintiff, you know, trying to eat the gizzard, they should have been aware of the risk. That argument won Walmart the case. So, you know, didn't have to pay anything. And we're all kind of going like, where in the world did it learn that? You know, we're going through the, the corpus, you know, all the data we use to train and stuff, nothing about chickens or stones, all these things. And I asked a couple of managing partners from some of the biggest law firms in the world, like, would your lawyers have figured this out? <laughs> They're like, not unless they were chicken farmers. So that's that's the power of being able to process so much different data, right? It's It was probably thinking like, okay, what are material facts? Why would a chicken have a stone? Oh, it turns out they eat stones and they're in the gizzard. And this is what happened. This guy said he been to the gizzard, chipped a stone, connected all those dots together. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. So when it's connecting these dots together on cases like that, it can also do that, I, I imagine, for, I, I'm going to say, bigger issues and the to me the bigger issues of course are climate change and feeding the world and uh you know animal welfare and all of these other things these are the issues close to my heart right and you work with the un and you are looking at some of these uh things through the lens of how ai might be able to help and i guess the question i i have is how how did you get into that? How did you get into the U UN 
sort of <laughs> doing doing AI, which in because in the developing world, there's just not that much technology. And and also, how is AI helping drive some of the some of the work that the UN is trying to do? I got involved in the UN because actually my good friend, Stephen Dabaraki, um, he was sitting on some of the some of the committees and there was like this big conference they do, I think every four or five years with all the world leaders and ambassadors and stuff. And I remember he called me up one day because I had just done a big favor for him and he wanted to thank me for that. And he's like, by the way, you know, I sit on this committee over here at the UN and uh, I put your name forward to give a, a keynote at this big event because, you know, they're all kind of concerned about what is AI and what should be done about it. And I'll be honest, as old, I thought he was just yanking my chain. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, right, Steve, and on the UN. It's like, no, seriously, a couple of the UN guys even said that they've heard you talk before and they're like, do you think you'd really do it? I'm like, yeah, right, whatever. Did not believe him, <laughs> right? Next day, I get an email, nice PDF attached to it, letter from the UN Secretary General inviting me to, to speak at this event. And I'm like, oh, I guess it is real. Wow. <laughs> So then, so then I said, okay, uh, I'll do it. I'm happy to help. And I was warned that at the time, and you know, it was 2015, that the UN leadership well, and the world leadership thinks that AI is, is Terminator time. It's going to rise right. up, conquer the world, eradicate humanity. <laughs> so uh, no pressure on me. Right. <laughs> so I, uh, I gave a more optimistic view about AI, but I talked a little bit about what it is, but I focused it more on how AI was already being used uh, in public service and how it could be applied towards the sustainable development goals. And my speech was really warmly received. So I survived. Whew. Yay. <laughs> but that evening uh, at the reception, the secretary general actually sought me out and he's like, Neil, you never actually thought about using the technology. We were kind of worried about what might be done, how we regulate it. But if we could actually use this for the sustainable development goals, this would be huge. And there's a lot of momentum, a lot of excitement. You know, uh, Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, you no know, showed up, some other people saying similar things. And the Secretary General said, like, I want to do something while we have this, this energy. And so I wound up meeting with him and his staff the next week. And from that was born the whole AI for Good initiative, where we're using AI and other emerging technologies to actually try and solve some of the problems around the sustainable development goals. So in the five and a half years or so we've been doing this, officially, <laughs> uh, I think we've completed a couple hundred projects, we've got 170 projects going on right now. It's a very solution focused initiative that we're, we're trying to help. And it's not like we're going to solve climate change with one big mega solution, but we've done like 30 smaller projects that help push that needle forward on combating climate change. That's awesome. Uh, I, I feel like you should have mic drop there. Boom. <laughs> because, <laughs> because no because it's such a this is such a a beautiful way to synthesize what is and what can be into something that's going to do good and and i think that that's amazing you're you're doing these are you focusing most of these in, on the developing world or on the developed world it's really both what i've okay. learned is that local problems have global solutions so you look at like there are parts in like malawi or like bangladesh where they know that they got to try and upskill more people to get better jobs. And, you know, they're working on things. And part of what we've done is create something called the innovation factory. So these like social impact entrepreneurs have more resources, access to funds, other things to pursue this, because if they figure out something that works very well for their community, odds are it can be replicated across the world and help everybody. Again, mic drop. That's awesome. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm ridiculously curious. So the innovation factory resources are great, and what we talked about earlier about mindset is you know I mean this is the innovative mindset podcast, so I have to sort of ask about it. How do you 
encourage people. Yes, they're social impact entrepreneurs or they're environmental entrepreneurs or something like that. Um, is there a framework? Is there a way to encourage people who might be thinking about it but haven't taken action or who might have started getting inspired but haven't even thought it through to to embrace innovative thinking? What is your thought on that? Absolutely. Innovation or disruptive thinking is not the exclusive domain of Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. Certainly hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I really believe that each one of us has the ability to be a, an innovator. Absolutely. I think the problem really is when people say like, well, how do I do that? Or, you know, how do you come up with these, like even these ideas, everyone says the same thing. Well, you got to think different or think outside the box. Okay. That's great. How do you actually do that? Right. And realizing that problem, one of the things I did a, a few years ago, or a couple of years ago, well, actually it was a few years ago. I'm, uh, time warp in the pandemic, I think it skewed things. But a few years ago, I actually looked back to my career and said, how did I actually figure some of this stuff out? And so putting, uh, you know, digital pen, to digital paper, I actually outlined a framework, which I call Tuckbo, that actually shows you how you can actually think differently. It actually enables people to be an innovator. And Tuckbo, well, it stands for something. The, the T is think different, which really helps us then ideate. And there's techniques and things that help us kind of break our normal mindset mm -hmm. and actually uncover these, you know, amazing or potentially disruptive ideas. Mm -hmm. Then the you is really understand different. So just because I have this great idea doesn't mean it's really valuable. And so the, the understand is really then of saying, What's the value that's actually getting produced? And is that aligned with the needs or the problem that's actually out there? And if the answer is yes, or I can, I can see how that alignment exists and articulate that, then you move on to the C, which is create different, which is actually implementing, you know, building out whatever product, service, whatever your idea is, you actually bring it to reality. Mm -hmm. Then you get to B, which is be different, which is then how do you actually drive adoption? Because let's be honest, most people not into change, right? Tend to be really change resistant. So, how do you overcome some of those barriers? And help people actually see and realize that value you're promising them. And then the O is own different, where you really have to also then build out the infrastructure to make your idea and the change successful. And that's one where I see a lot of organizations and individuals actually stumble at. And, and Tesla is actually a great example of that is why, why did they succeed with electric cars where so many people before them for decades had failed? It's not like they said, okay, hey, we have much improved battery technology. Not really so. And it's not really, oh, we have these sleek looking design cars. It's that Tesla was willing to address the biggest challenge or pain point people had, which was, I don't want to be driving and run out of electricity, right? So Tesla went out and built the infrastructure for that. They built the supercharging stations. They built an app to help you find, find them. They negotiated with, you know, shopping centers and other retailers and apartment complexes and corporate offices to have charging stations there. So people feel confident they'll always be able to get electricity. That's what, that was a big driver of their success was doing that infrastructure and owning different. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, it's funny, I have a friend coming into town tomorrow and he's driving an electric car and he spent a lot of time trying to figure out where are the chargers along his route to get here. And the fact that you're saying you have to extrapolate where you are to where you want to be. So building the electric car wasn't enough. Building the infrastructure and the methods for having people be able to actually use that electric car day to day, it's, that seems to be the key factor there. What are your thoughts on that? No, 100% is all that. I mean, that's the thing I think a lot of us tend to forget about, that we feel like we'll, we're going to create this great product or service and everyone will come and want it and use it. We got to be able to enable that to happen. That's why that, that own different I was talking about is actually so important mm -hmm. that we have to create, you know, I know I'm using the word infrastructure, but I think the, the buzzword today is now ecosystem <laughs> just to okay. support all this. <laughs> Right. And, and it, there, there is this notion of, of the environment has to be one that's, that's, 
ease of use for the for the end user, right? So usability and user experience is really important. And yet when we're planning it, you know, it's, it's I remember doing I used to do QA QC for National Geographic a long time ago and Oh, a coder doesn't give you a product thinking it's full of holes, right? They give you a product they think that they are finished with and now it's up to you to break it. But in their minds, it's as good as it can be until someone comes along to break it. So how do we think that way? How do we get to the point where we unlock our ability to to extrapolate to that ecosystem that you're talking about? Like, oh, not only are we going to create the electric car, but we're also going to create the ecosystem, the environment where people will be able to use that electric car easily. Interestingly enough, that's really about what everyone talks about, the the customer point of view. Okay. Can we actually put ourselves in the shoes of a customer? And Mm -hmm. that's a bigger challenge than I think people realize because they're like, Oh, well, I understand the customer, but then it's like, have you ever talked to any of them? Right. Oh, well, I, I know what they want. And it's like, it's, it's not the same thing. That's, I think that's, that's where we struggle. I actually knew a, a startup company it was a, a bunch of engineering grad students, the University of California system. Really amazing idea. They wanted to create a STEM toy. And the whole idea was to you know, help kids learn more about, obviously, science, technology, engineering, math to help them actually get you know good jobs in the future and so they created these little uh you know they tagged it inventing inventor so like these inventor kits mm-hmm. you know they made the comic or the, made the instruction book a comic book you know they, they did oh, all these you know really cool things and it's free form some things are structured they were targeting kids like seven to nine and you know, i met them because of the icorps program of the national, national science foundation i was assigned as their mentor and the first thing you do as part of the program is you have to go and talk to a hundred customers. Mm. So they're like, Hey, look, we've already got everything. We know this. They go talk to, you know, 10 parents to start off with. And they were shocked. They're like, the parents were like, Oh, look, you know, I, I don't care if the toy is educational, <laughs> you know, you're asking me to spend 50 <laughs> bucks. You know, I want to make, I want to make sure my kid has fun and actually, you know, enjoys playing with it. They're like, man, those, those parents don't care about their kids. You know, they don't want them to have a, good future talk to 10 more heard very similar feedback talk to 10 more and then they're like something is not right here right it's like the parents do not care about the educational aspect of the toy it's very much secondary if you really think about it you're trying to buy a you know educational toy for a seven-year-old that they can get a job when they graduate from college (laughs) 15 years out right right and I thought one mom put it really well when she's like, look, if I'm going to spend 50 bucks for a toy, it better keep my son occupied long enough for me to do the laundry uninterrupted. Ah. And uh, that's what they learned was that what the unfulfilled need for the parents wasn't the education. It wasn't like, oh, I'll create a bonding experience between parent and child. It's like, I just want my kid to play with the toy often and for long periods of time so I can go do other stuff. Hmm. And, you know, it's interesting. It's like when you have a cat and you bring home a cat toy and the cat is only interested in the box it came in, but not the <laughs> toy itself. Right. But but at the same time, like in that moment, you have to get innovative with your thinking. Right. They're, they probably had to go, OK, so how do we, in essence, rebrand this thing? This toy is so cool that, yeah, it's STEM activities, whatever, but it's so cool that your kid's going to be busy and excited for hours at a time, right? So what what did, what did what what advice did you give them to get them to change the way they were approaching it? In all honesty, I have to say that um, they wound up folding. Oh, right? no. We, we, had talk, we had talked about this and said, look, your, your value proposition is, is off base, right? get the STEM education, get the parent-child bonding time. That's not the unfulfilled customer need. Right. And I said, we can pivot here, right? Because of the free form of these other things. And like, that, this is not why we wanted to do this. And so they decided to unfortunately give it up. But mm. it's, a, it's a great example of that. This is, you know, what we talk about, again, put yourself in the customer's shoes you got to think about the experience for the customer, how they're going to interact with your product and service, about all the things they're going to need to support that. Like, are they going to need batteries? You know, are they going to need a, you know, a mobile device because there's an app component? These are all things that, unfortunately, a lot of people take for granted. 
And that's why I think design thinking is, is actually become so critical because we're not, we should not really be building just to a set of requirements. We think about how we kind of design and create, you know, our next great idea. We should be thinking about the experience. Talk to me about that, if you would. You said design thinking. Now, uh, to, I, I recently uh, interviewed somebody for the show who is an experienced designer, if you will. That's what she does. And you just said design thinking. Can you talk a little bit about what that is and how do we access our ability or build that skill to th think in those terms? Well, it's all about thinking about the user experience, Zolda. So give you an example, you know, early in the, you know, the, the AI days here, uh, about eight, nine years ago, working with uh, SoftBank and the robotics division, you know, they, they, they were creating different sets of robots to be concierges and things like that. And you know, all they're thinking is like, okay, we'll have some robot, maybe it's three feet tall, maybe it's six feet tall, just ask it questions, right? That's Talk, talking through that, it's like, well, what's what's really the point of that then, right? What's the experience you're trying to create for the users? And they're like, what do you mean? And they're like, well, are people going to be intimidated by having to now communicate with a robot? Do, do they want, you know, something that's a little bit more human-centered or jovial or something like that? So we start to kind of thinking through how, how would people really want to interact with the robot, especially when back then in particular, there was a real concern about the machines taking over mm. and so this became more than okay we're going to teach these the ai part of the robot all these great things about banking or if like you know it was like hilton the the restaurants and things to do in the area but we were actually going through and looking at all these different things and saying like look how would people actually want to interact with this and so we thought well we should really have the robots be, be able to crack jokes you know you could do high fives <laughs> You do selfies with the robot, right? Create a really more fun, interactive, human type of experience for people so they, they feel at ease because if they feel comfortable, they put a little bit more trust in what they're hearing and they have a better time. You know, it's interesting because as I'm listening to you, I'm kind of going, doesn't that depend, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, on the group of people you're trying to get to interact with this robot, right? So a group of people like me who'd be like, a robot, cool, would be different than a group of people who are hesitant or a little afraid or something like that. How do you do it? Like, is that something that is going to be good for people like me too? That kind of user experience? Or it, 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 am I not the demographic then if, some, if, if, I'm, if I would be like, wow, a robot, this is awesome. Well, this is a great thing in that you can give the robot, you know, so I'll call it kind of different ways or different personalities to interact with people based off that person's personality. Oh, ah, okay. Like, Whoa, cool robot, right? It'll probably go, hey, cool human, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So it can take in that kind of data and then sort of is it run the program i'm not sure exactly what the right language is there but behave in in a matter in accordance with what data it's received from the person reacting to it is that what you're saying yeah that's actually oh. one of the one amazing things that we've seen is that ai is actually better at reading the emotional state of a person than a human being in large part because it's got this laser like focus on you mm -hmm. it's not thinking about Oh man, do I have to be traffic or what are the kids up to or what are we gonna do for dinner? It's it's <laughs> paying right attention to you, it's listening to you, it's looking at the body language, it's your it's using neuro linguistics and kind of decoding from your the words, the tone of your voice, your personality, your values, how you like to be communicated, what words connect with you better. It's doing all these things to create a more, I'll call it individualized experience so that it's trying to find the best way to connect with you. That is so cool. <laughs> See, I would be I would be super excited about that. And, and so when you're talking with someone like me, I'm I'm not the most tech savvy, but I'm pretty tech savvy. But then you're you're also working in the developing world with people who might not be as tech savvy on bringing some of this stuff to them as part of the UN. 
is is there a difference or does the AI go, okay, this person's not tech savvy at all and I'm going to have to respond accordingly? There's there's a little of that. There's also, again, the, this whole idea about design thinking and the user experience, how you set that up. So I've done a lot of work with farmers like in Bangladesh. Mm-hmm. And you think about, again, not the, the best infrastructure, right? So you have to consider, like, if we're going to help them, you know, grow more crops with less resources, what's the best way to do that? And you got, you know, you got these great data scientists, and you got these guys with, you know, agricultural PhD saying like, well, there's so much data we can think about climate and insect infestation and cash crops versus nutritional crops. And I won't bore you with all the stuff, but they're like, we can create these dashboards and stuff, and then they can connect the data. And it's like, we're working with a bunch of farmers that, you know, probably haven't taken anything beyond basic math. Right. You know, that's, that's not going to help them. We can give them all this great information. We can create all these nice reports and dashboards. It's not going to help them. And if they need stuff that requires a high speed internet connection, it's not going to work for them. Mm. So we really have to think about what's the best way we can help them and help, you know, package the information up so they can make good decisions given, you know, their, educational state given the infrastructure and so we were able to come up with a really self-contained very simple app that all it required was a cellular connection Mm -hmm. right it had a very simple set of things but the ai would actually make recommendations and so the the person could actually play around with it say well if i were to grow more of this or grow more of that what does that do for how much crop I can do, how many, how much money I can make, or how much food I can produce for the local community, balance that out, also show how much water, how much topsoil consumption, that kind of stuff. And so really let them help them actually then optimize in a way that they could understand and actually do. I love that. That is so cool. Okay. So when you're doing that, when you're when you are working with farmers like that, I remember, for example, uh, the the I was in South Africa doing a, a NASA workshop a number of years ago, and Nokia had basically come in and given cell phones to people who had never had a landline, right? So I'm teaching a workshop, and somebody there are 80 people from all over all over Africa, and somebody gets a phone call in the middle of what I'm teaching on soil soil science. In fact, uh, that's what we were talking about: far agriculture and soil science. And he picks up the phone and he starts talking. And after he gets done, I said, you know, would you mind uh, putting your phone away? And he goes, oh, no, no, someone might call. And then I said, okay, well, then if if you need to take a phone call, can you leave the room so that I can keep teaching? He goes, oh, no, 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 I want to be sure I can hear what you're saying. So it was this weird sort of conundrum. But afterwards, and the reason I'm telling you the story, afterwards, somebody took me aside who was one of one of our hosts for this workshop and he said you have to understand these are people who have never had a landline and up until they got these cell phones if they wanted to connect with someone 30 miles away they'd have to go to that place and talk to them so talking on a cell phone is revolutionary right so they and and, and yet they had really jumped on the technology and everyone who had a cell phone was calling and they loved it. So when you're talking about, you know, working within the, the means, there are lots of people who were jumping up and grabbing that technology. And so it, it was a real opportunity for Nokia. But then there are other enterprises, I think, that can be just as successful in the developing world. I'm not sure they're thinking in those terms. What are your thoughts on that? Are we doing enough in the developing world like various enterprises, NGOs, things like that. And if, if I don't know, this is an opinion thing, are we doing enough? And if not, what could we be doing to help those folks think more like entrepreneurs, but also us be more like entrepreneurs so that we can work with the developing world in a way that's substantive and beneficial? Interesting question, because I, I see two facets to this. The, the first is we're not doing enough, not for lack of of trying, but I think we're not doing it uh, the most effective way we could. Mm. There, there's a lot of overlapping programs and you know, other things going on. And we know that, again, there are some infrastructural issues mm-hmm. behind uh, climate change. The number two initiative for the U.S. Secretary General 
is actually global connectivity. Mm. That having a you know stable high speed internet connection and access to mobile devices has become absolutely vital. Right. Not not so we can all just go stream Yellowstone, but <laughs> yeah, we know that the the child that has access to like an iPad at two years old, their their cognitive skills around some of this stuff is much more developed than the child who gets the iPad at eight years old. Mm. And that has a lot of obviously repercussions down the line in terms of education and, and job opportunities. Sure. So th- that's the challenge is how do we optimize the programs and how do we you know get this infrastructure everywhere it's needed. And the second is we're always thinking about playing catch up rather than leapfrog. Mm. And, I, and I think that's ironically, uh, you know, a mature world syndrome. So, you know, I love your example about the cell phones in South Africa, right? A lot of places in Africa didn't have landlines, same thing in Asia. So they didn't have the, the landline infrastructure that the United States and like Europe had. Right. Interestingly enough, because, because of that, when mobile phones started coming out, the penetration was a lot faster in Africa and Asia. And as a result, because people were had them, they were using them, they were far more open to mobile related solutions. So you think about like mobile payment and the digital currency, these things actually took off a lot faster in Africa mm. and Asia than over here, because we we're trying to make this transition now from a landline to mobile kind of infrastructure or culture where they just leapfrogged. They skipped the whole landline step right. and they're already off to the races. And that's something that we actually want to facilitate because we've seen these, these you know, you know, social impact entrepreneurs, well, I guess all entrepreneurs come up with really innovative ideas leveraging this new type of technology. And that's one of the things we try to do with the, the United Nations Innovation Factory is actually try and foster that by giving these social impact entrepreneurs resources, access to equipment, funding, mentors, all that stuff to spur that on because local problems have global solutions. That's amazing. All right, so talk to me about that. Talk to me about the Innovation Factory. If someone has, and, and you know, I'm not talking about myself, although that would be super cool, but if someone has uh, an amazing idea, what would be the steps of getting involved, if, if, it, if it's even possible, with this innovation factory to, like, I'll give you an example. I, there's a wonderful uh, series on Netflix called The Art of Design, which I devoured because it's all about innovative designers. And one of them was an architect who is Danish, I believe, or Icelandic, I forget which, but he developed this beautiful little thing called Little Sun. It looks like a little flower, like a little sunflower, but it's a uh, uh, photosensitive and uh, rechargeable, you know, solar rechargeable little light that basically if I buy one, one gets sent to somewhere in Africa and other places that don't have access to electricity because their thought is that someone who's got access to light at night after the sun goes down can use that time to read or to study or to learn or something like that. So these little solar rechargeable little suns get sent anytime somebody buys one. So that's the kind of thing. And I think I think they ended up working with the UN for this, but to, to get those little suns to, to places in especially Africa and the developing world where they didn't have that before. So if someone has an idea, something like that, that could be really revolutionary for people who might need it, what would they need to do in order to become involved with the Innovation Factory? It's very simple. All you gotta do is go to the portal, you can Google it up, and there's a bunch of information and you apply for the program. The awesome. The only hard, hard requirement is that you are a social impact entrepreneur and that you can align your work with at least one of the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. That, that's it. The whole goal is to actually help entrepreneurs around the world. And I think at last count, we have over a thousand startups wow. participating. Oh, that's awesome. I love it. All right. You know what? I'm going to Google that and put that in the show notes so that if you're listening to this, you'll be able to get in there and do it yourself. Uh, Neil, I again, I can keep you for the next six hours, but I know you have 
you have a life to get back to. So I, I have just a couple more questions if it's okay. You mentioned something about Planet Home, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what that is and what your goals are for it. Planet Home is an organization dedicated to environmental issues and like other things around people and lifestyle. So I'm trying to think of a very simple way of explaining this. We, we all are, we all can do something. There are all things that we're willing to, to do and changing our behaviors to you know, help, help the planet because we've only got one planet. I know we like to talk about moon shots, but what about earth shots? Absolutely. And so Planet Home is really focused then on helping connecting people with these solutions or connecting them with small things that they can actually do to, you know, reduce your carbon footprint or use less water or use less plastic, you know, whatever it might be your personal passion. Now, the, the interesting thing here is we often don't know our, our impacts Mm. So one of the things they're, they've actually put together is a bunch of data and some calculators on how we can actually assess our, our environmental impact or carbon you know, output, if you will, in that regard. So real simple example, hopefully, is I knew someone said that they're only eating impossible meat now. So they don't they want to avoid the cows, you know. I believe uh, livestock is the second biggest or third biggest source of uh, carbon production in the world. And so it sounds great. And I'm thinking to myself, though, it's like, but you live in Wyoming. He's like, so where's that impossible meat coming from? He's like, I don't know. So he researched it and he said he found out it was actually being produced on the West Coast and then it was being trucked into Wyoming. So it turns out that that whole supply chain distribution process produced more carbon than if you just ate an actual beef burger. As a vegan, I vote for impossible burgers and beyond <laughs> burgers. Uh, you, you know, but that but that's the thing. Yes, we can we can do that. We can go, oh, I'm only gonna eat impossible, or you could go, I'm gonna do like I do and really mitigate that by not eating any of that stuff. So I eat a lot of vegetables and fruits and things like that. But there are those are those are the kinds of things, though. Those are the kinds of calculations. Those are the kinds of bits of data that I think we need in order to know and become aware if we don't know what impact we're having. Right. If you want to know what does my I was talking to my friend who, who you know, visiting me and he said, yeah, I drive an electric car and I have lowered my carbon footprint a great deal, but he also has gone further and he's put solar panels on his house. Now we can't all afford to do that and I rent, so I can't do that at all. But there are ways that you can look at this and go, what can I do? And sometimes it's overwhelming, but I think, and you can do, uh, let me know what you think of this, Neil. I think small steps are still steps. So we can take small steps and also assess where we are in order to figure out what we're gonna do and what we can do to mitigate some of these big problems that, that we are facing as a, as a community on this whole planet. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's exactly right, Zolda. Not everyone's gonna willing to do everything. Ironically, I, you know, pre-pandemic, I was in San Francisco for some meetings and there was a reporter there that wanted to interview me and we were talking about things and while she was not willing to give up her 20 minute showers, she was willing to adopt a house plant. And I think that's, that's the key thing is matching people to those things that they're, they're willing and want to do. Mm -hmm. Now, the challenge is, is that she's like, even if I adopt a house plant, what, what difference does that make? And it's like, well, small things add up in the aggregate. And that's one of the things that again, Planet Home's trying to do is show what everybody is doing and how it adds together to move that needle. You know, I, I love those water body fill stations, right? And then because people are like, okay, great, I can get my water. But I know some people are like, well, I do that, but how, how much plastic am I really saving? Well, they have a counter on there. So you can see when you fill up that bottle, it's like, wow, I and everybody else have saved 287,000 plastic bottles this month. That's a difference maker. And I think that's the piece that we've always kind of been lacking because 
I, I know what I'm doing. And it's like, I personally can't solve climate change by my own behaviors. But if, you know, even if I cut my, my shower time from five minutes to four minutes, it doesn't seem like much. But if 10 million other people start doing that, we move the needle. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, it's interesting. I do, a, when I, I go into schools and we talk about the environment and the ecosystem, earth science and all that. And I have a presentation called Water, Water Everywhere. And when I talk about just turning off the water while you're soaping up your hands, that, that three minutes that you're spending time brushing your teeth, or that's eight gallons a, a minute of water are going down the drain for real, right? And so what we do, like you said about the water bottles and how many plastic bottles you have not used, I've actually had students put a bowl at the bottom of the sink and wash their hands and see how much water fills in the bowl while they're washing their hands with the water running. And seeing it viscerally changes how you view what you can do. You know, so your point is very well made there that that if you see the feedback, if you get the feedback on what you are doing or not doing, you can make better informed decisions. Absolutely. And I think you know, we all have a homework assignment now and we should put a bowl the next time we wash our hands and see how much water is there. Yeah, I it's, love a, that. it's a great way of doing it. And kids, you know, what's really funny is when I get feedback from parents, my kid has made me turn off the faucet. We did the experiment and now I'm turning off the faucet when I wash my hands. And that's a win. As far as I'm concerned, that's a huge win, not just for each individual person, but but for the earth. You know, to me, that when we can start seeing those tiny steps become a bigger solution, if you will, then then we really can move the needle. Yep. I love that. I love I love that you're doing this. And I'm yay. I'm I'm like <laughs> yeah, I, I'm I'm a Neil Sahota fangirl now. Uh I, I would love if it's okay with you, uh, if you don't mind, people learn differently, as you know. Would you mind giving your social media, how people can find you. I'm going to find the the UN thing for the social entrepreneurs, but I'd love it if you'd give how people can find you if they want to if they want to learn more about you and your work, your website and your socials. Would you mind doing that? Be happy to. So my website is actually just my name, neilsahoda.com. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, which is just, you know, again, my name, Neil Sahoda, or you can find me on Twitter and Instagram, which is, you know, at Neil underscore Sahoda. And I mean, feel free to, to follow me. I do post often. I try to share the latest information going out there. Some of also the trends going on in the social impact world, the AI world, and more importantly, disruptive thinking. And, uh, you know, if you ever have an idea or wondering how to get connected to the UN, feel free to, to message me. That's awesome. And I, I want to say one other thing that is that is in my notes is artistic intelligence. Can you talk just a little bit about that? Because for me, when you talk about art and sustainability and tech, that I, that's my I'm all about creativity, leading and driving cool innovation. So would you mind talking just a little bit about what that is? Sure. So my big thing is what I call art plus sustainability plus technology. Sustainability is the goal. Technology is a tool to achieve that goal, but that only works so far. We have to you know, influence people's thinking and behavior. And I found art's the best way to do that. And so as part of the AI for Good initiative, we uh, actually experimented with the uh, AI and art track at our summit in 2019. And I will tell you, Zolda, it was the most heavily trafficked part of the summit. We did a little cultural night like never before. It was amazingly received. And if people are interested in checking that out, there are snippets of it that the UN posted on YouTube. But we've so much so many artists and so many people are actually using AI now in their work. Like you know, I talked to Reeps One who uh he's a beatboxer, but he's like the human voice hasn't been disrupted in 50,000 years. I want to, he, he's like, I can use AI to do that. AI can create sounds that humans can't make. And so because of the success of all this, I want to showcase more of this, especially that we can use, you know, art, not just, you know, create new forms of art, but use art to influence people towards the SDG, that we started a, a podcast. So we started a little mini podcast series 
where we're actually interviewing some of the top artists using AI to actually drive social impact issues. That is awesome. And I'm going to put that link also into the show notes, you know, and it's funny as a, I'm an artist myself. And so looking at how specifically creativity drives innovation, how our own artistic spark can do that is so powerful. So I'm super glad that you're doing it on such a big scale as working through the United Nations and looking at it in that perspective. I think that's amazing. And I want to get involved. I want to figure out how I can get involved. That's that's really fantastic. Neil, I'm super, super grateful that you took the time to join me on the show. And I know we're going to come back in just a second to do the bonus episode, the little bitty mini bonus episode that we're doing together. But I wanted to ask you one last question, if it's okay. Sure. Oh, great. Thank you. And it's a silly question, but I find that it yields some profound results. And the question is this, if you had an airplane, environmentally friendly, of course, that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Wow, that's an interesting question. Huh, skywrite anything. You know, I would probably have it at Skyright. You are an innovator. So everybody knows there's something they can do to help, to change, to drive value, and hopefully create positive social impact. That's awesome. You're singing my song, Neil. I want to <laughs> I want to figure out ways we can work together because that's exactly what I do. So I'm like, yay, that's awesome. Neil, again, I'm super, super grateful that you took the time to be on the show and to talk about something so close to my heart, obviously, as you can tell, and super important. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks for having me on. This was a blast. Yeah, it was so much fun. I, I, I'm, I'm, again, I'm a Neil Sohota fangirl now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start sitting on your LinkedIn and be like, "Hi, Neil, how are you?" So, <laughs> uh, I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. This is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Innovative Mindset Podcast. As always, you need to check out the bonus episode because we're gonna get a little bit more fun and personal. We're gonna get some of Neil's recommendations and fun favorite things. Until next time, as always, I remind you to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2022. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, remember to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind.